brand new management. This guy was going to make sure nobody else was going to get the chance to manage his stuff. Well, except his dog, I guess. Uh, was going to get a second chance at the house. Um, if you grab a sheet next to you uh, that says brand new management on the top, I, wanna, I want you to go to the memory verse, uh, and we're going to share that with you, and then share a few other scriptures, and then dive into some talk about this brand new management. Our memory verse says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, it starts off, this verse starts off with just the, the, the emphasis here. Do you not know, in other words, are you not aware that your bodies... They are temples. In other words, places of dwelling. They are actually a place of worship. And, and it's a place that the Holy Spirit lives. And he's talking to believers, someone who has believed in Christ and received his forgiveness in their lives. He's saying he, God has put his Holy Spirit in you. He lives in you. And, and that's the next phrase. Who is in you, whom you have received from God. Don't you know that? Now, he's talking to some people who were using their body for things that were not honoring to God. Um, there was sexual misconduct going on and various things like that, and people were just kind of taking their bodies, in a sense, for granted, kind of doing whatever they wanted to do with them. And Paul's reminding him, he says, don't you even know, don't you, aren't you aware that this body that you have is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit dwells there, and uh, and and. And then the next phrase, you are not your own. Now, I already have it in bold letters for you. You may want to circle that. You might want to highlight it. You might want to do something else. But that is a key phrase to this message today. You are not your own. Now, I'm particularly talking to people who have accepted Christ, who, who, who would consider themselves to be Christ followers. Um, Paul is saying, if you have received the forgiveness God gives and God has placed his Holy Spirit in you, then understand you're not your own. And here he goes on to explain, you were bought at a price. And the price happened to be the death of Jesus Christ. That was the price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, with your entire beings. Honor God. So really, and we could summarize maybe, what is, the Christian's, what is the Christian's lifetime goal? It should be to honor God with our entire being. That should be our goal. If you want a simple goal for every person here who follow, considers themselves to be a Christ follower, is to honor God with your life. To, to make sure that what you do, how you live, the words you say, the thoughts you think, the things that happen in your life, that they would honor God. And I have to say this, even though that isn't what gains us our salvation, it is the way that we show our gratitude and appreciation for that salvation. So our job is fairly simple, even though it's comprehensive. Honor God with your bodies, with your entire being. Now, I want to go on and make a case here through some scriptures that uh, this is not just like a a loose statement here that Paul made in the New Testament that you could just sort of flippantly come up with other, other, other things about it to say, well, maybe he meant this or maybe he meant that. You can see that there's an intent throughout Scripture that this is true, and even going back into, um, into the Old Testament. But first of all, let's go on to uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 36 through 36. It says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And, and the essence of this is that if we think we're going to set out to create some strategy where we can preserve our life, in other words, that's our entire mission. I'm going to make my life safe. I'm going to guarantee my life being what I think it can be, that that person will lose their life. But whoever loses their life for me, and for the gospel, will save it. In other words, if I 
not only receive the gospel, the good news, but also live according to the gospel. In other words, going back to what we said in this first verse that we talked about, honoring God with our lives. If we do that, we will not lose our lives. We will actually save them. And so the question might be, well, what if I don't get to do what I want to do? What if God tells me I have to go someplace in the world that I don't want to go? What if God tells me that I have to become a missionary or become a pastor? What if God tells me that I have to go, go work in an inner city mission? What if God tells me that I have to do this or do that? We come up with all these different things. What if he tells me? Well, I don't know what he might tell you to do. In most cases, you know, sometimes we still worry about that, but the reality is the percentage of believers who are foreign missionaries and percentage of believers who are pastors, the percentage of believers who are inner city uh, workers is pretty small. Now, now, there maybe needs to be more of them, I don't know, but, but it's not like everybody, is, God asks everybody to do that, but what he does do is ask us to give him our lives and to dedicate our lives to him and to his purposes. And verse 36 says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul. In other words, if you got everything you wanted, everything that you had personally desired, if you got it all, but had ignored God in the process, what have you gained? And if you have gotten God and you're serving him, he's not saying that you can't have anything in this world. You're in this world. You're going to have things in this world. You're going to be a part of it. But I can tell you the end result of that, what he is saying is, you can live with that now, and you can live with that for all of eternity. Job, early, early on in uh, the existence of mankind, he said this. And understand and remember that at the time this happened, or just prior to him saying this, Job was the wealthiest man on the face of the earth. He was also a man who God bragged on. God bragged on him, even to Satan. And a couple of us heard a message this past summer about what it takes to get on God's brag list and what happens when you're on God's brag list. I think sometimes we don't want to be on God's brag list because we're afraid of some of the attention we might get from the spiritual world, so to speak. Well, Job was on God's brag list. God was bragging about him to Satan. And Satan basically said, well, sure, why wouldn't he serve you? I mean, he's got everything. He's the wealthiest man in the world. He's got all the stuff, all the, he got all, he's got it all. He even rides a Harley, you know? Why wouldn't he serve? You know, I'm just, you know, but, but, but he's when he's got everything. He's got everything a man would want. Why wouldn't he serve you? So God took his hands off of him except for his physical life. And Satan went right to work and began to demolish so much of what he had. And here is what Job said. When he got all the news about all the destruction that happened to his great resources and to his family, he said, the Lord gave, key phrase there, he didn't say, well, look what all I had accomplished, look what all I had done, look what all I had amassed, look what all I had done. He goes, the Lord gave. Do you know what that means? That means Job understood that everything that he had was a gift from God. He understood that basic principle that everything in his life, including his children, were a gift from God. They came from God. And that is the only way he could make the statement, the complete statement. He said, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. The next statement is amazing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. One of my favorite songs is taken from that passage of scripture. Not because I like so much the taken away part, but what I've come to believe and realize is you can't have all of God's blessings without sometimes some things being removed from you as well. And you have to make up your mind if you're gonna praise God in the plenty, and I don't, I'm not talking about just financial right now, I'm talking about in everything in life. If you're gonna pray, praise God with all of the blessings that he has, you still have to have a mindset. If you understand and know the hand of God, you have to be able to praise him in the worst and the hardest times as well. Don't praise, you don't have to praise him for bad things that happen, but we praise him for who he is. Job says, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
And at the core of that, it speaks to Job's understanding of God. And it's an understanding that I hope that we'll walk away here today with a little clearer perspective on. I want you to go to Chronicles 29, where David is standing before the people. He's saying a prayer. He's saying, therefore, David, bless the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. You know, when I was reading that, I smiled a little bit because I've been in church my whole life. I think I was born in the second row and then they moved me to the front row. And then, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm, I mean I, I've, I've been in church my whole life. I, I think I've probably, uh, out of my 55 years, I've, um, I've, uh, I've probably missed, I, I doubt I've missed more than half a dozen Sundays in all those years. So probably what that God, God's going to allow me to do when I get to heaven, that probably means he's going to allow me to sit on the back row you know, in heaven, you know, is past notes and stuff like that, you know, anyway, because I always seem to have to be put on the front row all through because my father was a pastor and, um, and, and anyway, and I, and so I, I've, I've been in church folks. And, uh, one of the things I've noticed in a lot of people's prayers over the years, if people would say it's somewhere along in the prayer, they would go, and we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise, all the honor and the glory and the praise. And I'm going, you know, I mean, it all sounded, it sounded good, but sometimes it sounded like that, like I've done sometimes when I pray for my food, you know, just because it's a habit, I have something in front of me, I go, oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this food. You know, like I'm going, you know, 10 minutes later, I'm going, did I pray? You know why you didn't know you didn't pray, Rod? Not because you're getting old, decrepit, because you just, it's a good habit to have, but you prayed out of habit. You didn't even know God was anywhere near. You weren't even talking to God. You just prayed just because that's what you do. You just said those words. And so sometimes in the church, we do that, we get these phrases, we just want to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And we don't think about what we're saying. But when I, and, I, and so I, I kind of smiled when I read that. And I'm going, well, David did it too. You know, he's going, he's in his prayer. And he's going, we're just going to give you all the praise and power and the glory. And I'm going like, how can we, you know, what do, what do we mean when we say that? And I got to looking at it and I'm going, now I'm thinking that David meant this if you'll follow along the rest of his prayer. I don't think he was just using the phrase he heard in the synagogue or the temple or whatever. He was like, this, he understood what he was saying with these words because you listen to what follows. He said, Lord, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power. He wasn't saying, I give you glory and power. He's going, yours is. You have power and you have glory and you have victory and you have majesty because of this. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. All. Everything that's in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is a kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Job was not the only one who had an understanding that everything that he had came from God. David did too. And he made it very clear in this prayer. And then a couple of psalms that come also out of the heart of David. says, the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and who? Pardon me? And who? The world and and those, those who dwell therein. I mean, that's talking about me. It's talking about you. It's, it says that it, it belongs to God. You belong to God. I belong to God. Everything in this world belongs to God. And then in Psalm 8, it says, What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion. How do we have dominion? God did what? Gave us, he gave us dominion. How do, we have, how do we have glory and honor? How do we become people of importance? How do we have influence? Because God gives it to us. You've put all things under his feet. 
and you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. In other words, the creation, he's given us charge to keep all of that. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What power, what honor, what accomplishments, what wealth we have has come to us through the gracious hand of God. Now, I'm not going to say that you don't have any part in that, okay? I remember an old man who, a story about an old man who had taken over about 20 acres and he was all grown over and everything and he turned it into a beautiful garden. And uh, someone came by and said, and, and said, sir, he said, uh, I just want to give, give thanks to God for this beautiful, beautiful piece of land. This is beautiful. Isn't God great? And the old man felt a little bit offended, so he said, uh, well, you should have seen it when he had it by himself. You know? <laughs> and, and so the deal is this. God does use us, and that's the, he gives us dominion over. He gives us power. He gives us the ability. He gives us resources. He gives that to us. But we should never forget in all of the things that we accomplish and achieve, it came from him. It's from his good hand. And uh, I was thinking, uh, Tyler, as I was reading this passage uh, where he gives us dominion over, the, over the, all sheep and oxen and beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, um, if you, if you want to see a couple big catch, nice fish, you know, he told me yesterday at men's breakfast, by the way, if you missed men's breakfast, you missed a great, you missed a great time. So make sure you get on your calendars for this, uh, this next one. What day is it, Dave? 15th, 15th of February. Make sure right after you've had a great Valentine's event, come and tell everybody about it. You know, next morning at pastor's breakfast or not pastor's breakfast, at, at men's breakfast and, um, make everybody else feel guilty for how well you treated your wife. Okay. And, uh, and, but Tyler said, hey, I've got to, I want to show you a couple of fish I caught. And I'm thinking, you know, I bet you they're just minnows and he's enlarged them or something. You know, like there were two sharks that he caught. I mean, they were big old things. I mean, they're not, you know, not as big as sharks can get, but for bringing them in on a boat, big. And, uh, and I was just thinking about it because deep sea fishing is actually something that I really enjoy doing, especially if it's in my brother's boat. Because then he has all the headache of keeping up the boat. He has all the headache of keeping up with the fishing rods or anything. All I do is get in the boat, go out with him, catch some big fish, come back and brag about it, you know. And so it's like, it's, it's a, that's, that's my style of fishing right there. And uh, I'll help him clean it up a little bit when we're done. Then it's like, you, you have all the other problems. Just I want to just come down and do deep sea fishing with you. But, um, but he's, given us, he's given us dominion over all of these things. And, and even though, you know, obviously sometimes we may not feel like we're really in charge the reality is, if you think about it, man has subdued this world, but it's only because of God giving us the ability to do that. Let's go on to the last passage of scripture that I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to kind of take this theme and idea and break it down a little bit. What does this look like for you and for me every day? From 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says this. This is how one should regard us. Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth, which is a church that... Um, had plenty of problems. It was filled with people who had plenty of problems. This is not a, this is not like a, a, a you know, five star spiritual church. They were challenged in many ways. But he's clarifying some things for them. He says, "This is how one should regard us, speaking of himself, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found what faithful. It's required of stewards that they be found." Faithful. You might want to even circle the word, even though I have it highlighted. You might want to, you might want to circle the word faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In other words, Paul was saying, it's, it's okay if you want to sit in judgment, but it, that's, not going to really, that's not really what matters to me. I understand I have accountability to you and to those things as your spiritual leader. Um, and I have accountability to the law, those kind of things. But in fact, I don't even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against me, but I am not thereby acquitted. In other words, he's saying, as far as I can tell, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not living illegal. I'm not doing something immoral. I haven't done something wrong. But I'm not going to you know, say, well, I'm innocent. There's nothing wrong with me. And the reason he's not is because it's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, 
speaking of God, who will bring to light. This is something to keep in mind. I have it heavily underlined on my sheet. God will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. I I don't know if it, it struck you or you caught that or not, but that's a really, really significant statement. God will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Then each one will receive. Now here's what we might expect at this point. And it could fit, the word could fit here. But the word that Paul used here was interesting to me. And I think this goes into the context of what he's saying. We could say, then each one will receive his condemnation from God because of the things God's going to reveal that were hidden in the dark. Is that possible? It's very possible. That's not what Paul was emphasizing here. Here's what he said. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. In other words, it's what we were talking about a few weeks ago when I had Renee stand, that your faithfulness, you don't, have to, you don't have to wear it on your sleeve. You know, you don't have to put it on 10 bumper stickers in the back of your car. You don't have to go around and tell everybody. And I read again in the, uh, in, in the New Testament where whenever the Pharisees would do a good work, I mean, if you were a trumpeteer back then, you could easily get work. Because they hired trumpeteers to walk along near them. And whenever they were about ready to do a good deed, they would, before they did it, they'd come up maybe to this beggar or something. They're going to give them some money or give them something. They'd have their trumpeteer blow their horn. Get everybody's attention. Toot the horn. I guess that's why we say don't toot your own horn. You know, I don't know. Maybe some of them were trumpeteers themselves and they could play, you know, toot their own horn. But bottom line is they would have this big, big display, get everybody's attention. And then once they had everybody's attention, then they would do their good deed. I know we're going like, you've got to be kidding. We don't, we're a lot more subtle than that. We do our good deed and then we start get on the phone or get on Facebook or we, you know, or, or we wait till the next prayer meeting. And then we try to be as humble as we can and say, you know, that little old lady, I felt so sorry for her. Something just tugged in my heart, and I went over there, and I carried her. You know, we still find our ways to toot our own horn, don't you think? I think we do. So, so the reality is what Paul's saying here is, you know what? Whether your deeds are, are great and need a lot of commendation, or even if it was something you could find yourself in trouble for, understand this, I'm not your judge, and you're not my judge, but we do have a judge, and one day we'll stand before that judge, and we will give an account. And not only will he direct some things at us that need to be fixed and changed or corrected or exposed, but he also will honor us for the things that deserve to be honored. So, my little parade through the scriptures... Not that there are tons of other scriptures that keep speaking to this over and over again, but I'd like for you to turn your sheets over, and now let's look at this management, this brand new management thing. And you see at the top of your sheet, it says on the left side, old management, on the right side, brand new management. Here's what the old management is. In other words, here's the way we have a tendency to operate when left to ourselves. And let me also just bring to mind maybe a little bit of a a word picture for a little situation that maybe you can carry through as a bit of an analogy. Um, If you've ever seen a store before that maybe was going through a tough time or whatever, and then all of a sudden you see the sign out there, under new management. As I had mentioned in the bulletin a few weeks ago, or maybe even today it's in the bulletin still, but... um, When it says under new management, there's a lot being said in that. And and, and in essence, what it really is saying is the previous management did a terrible job. I, I know you didn't like it here. I know things were going to pot. I know it was awful. But please give us another chance. Now, unfortunately, sometimes they don't really change management. They just put a new sign out. And have you ever gone in a place like that and you're going, 
well, okay, I'll give them one more chance. I'll try it again. And you go in and go, well, it looks like everybody that was here is here before. They didn't clean house very good. I guess what they did, they gave them a pep talk and said, if you guys don't straighten up, man, we're toast. you got to get it together. And so what happens is not much changes. And so wherever it was headed before, it's still headed there. Old management is not, it's kind of like just believing somehow it's all up to me and I can do it and I can keep doing it and keep doing it. Let me really, it, it, the old management style is we're talking about here is this, it's ownership. Speaking in terms of our life, our life, it emphasizes that some, something belongs to a particular person and not to somebody else. In other words, it says, I own my life. I own my life. I own my family. I own this. I own that. I own it's where it is mine. You're like, you know, the little kid who um, who, who goes to visit his neighbor or something and starts thinking that looks like a really nice toy to play with, and they go to reach out and touch it, and the neighbor kid goes, That's mine. In other words, we're gonna get it clear, we're gonna be very, very clear about the ownership issue here. And uh, you don't touch that, that's mine. And so that, that's kind of the mindset that we're talking about, kind of the old management mindset. The brand new management that I believe is very reflective of God's perspective of what our life is about is that we are stewards or the stewardship. It's the responsibility to take care of something one does not own. And I hate to break the news to you, but if you're a Christ follower, you do not own your own life. In fact, if you don't believe me, go back again to your memory verse. It says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. When you surrendered your life to Christ, you were saying, you're the boss. You're in charge. You put your Holy Spirit in me to call the shots, to give me direction, certainly to give me comfort, and, and to guide my life. But you're in charge. Now, for us in America, that seems like such a foreign idea because we're all about ownership, and I believe in personal ownership. I believe everyone that can and will should own their home. Everyone that can and will should own their stuff, you know, own, own things. I, I believe in personal ownership in that sense. But what I don't believe in is in within the realm of spiritual life that whatever we have accumulated or we own here on this earth, stuff, people, family members, other, you know, whatever you might be in your, in your tribe, so as to speak, that belongs to you, I do not believe that we are truly the owners of that. We are stewards of what God has given us, and we are stewards of this very life. I will not give an account to you for how I live my life, but I will give an account to God for how I live my life. And, and, and even though, and when I say that I don't give an account, I do still even give an account to other people, but ultimately even that accounting falls short compared to my accounting to God. Because some people might hold me accountable for something God doesn't. So ultimately, the choices I make have to come under the accountability of God, ultimately. So I've broken up the seven areas that we like to talk about some here, and areas that I, we talk about because they're, part, they're the stuff of life. And so I've broken them into three categories. The first one is your life. The second one is your stuff. And the third one is your people. Um, so let's start with your life. Let's look at the intellectual part of your life. And let's ask the question, are you operating under old management or brand new management? Are you the owner or is God the owner and you're the steward? You say, well, I, I, I can think whatever I want to think. I can learn whatever I want to. What are you, the thought police? No, I'm not. And, 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 and since God gave you a free will, he's even chosen not to be. But I do believe he has some things to say about it. And if we were to be good stewards of the mind that God has given us, then we'll pay attention. Now, at this point, we were getting in, I was getting into so many scriptures and things, I kind of had to go back and say, you know what I'm going to do in order for us to get this done today? I'm going to allow the foundational scriptures that we gave at the outset to build the case that you are not your own, you're bought with a price, you belong to God, God has and owns everything. He, any dignity, any power, any glory that our life is and has and possesses or ever will have is because of who God is and how he has worked in us and what he's given to us to work with. And so that's the basis of, of everything here. 
So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be given a lot of other scripture from here, even though there's tons of scripture we could use for time's sake. Um, and we we'll, don't worry, we'll keep coming back to this this issue uh, enough times that you'll you have plenty of chance to get scriptures for each one of these. So intellectual, what do you fill your mind with? In the old management, it may be okay if you fill your mind with trash. Do I need to define trash? I don't think I do, do I? Basically, do you watch television, you know? I mean, okay, is that kind of, I mean, that kind of might take that in, you know? Um, for the most part, there's, you know, uh, football, huh? That's, football's all right, yeah. Hey, you gotta, you gotta figure your own trash out, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm just, you know. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, here's, here's the reason I don't want to overdefine it, it's because of this. Because part of the journey is us understanding in our spirit what God wants us to be put into our minds and what he doesn't. What about filling our mind with fairy tales? You know, I, I, I know this is like, sounds like I'm like a hobby horse in here or something a little bit in the sermon. I'm not common, it's not a common thing for me. But every once in a while I think it does a little good to meddle. Um, if I were to ask you, Today, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'm going to, if I were to ask you how many novels you've read this past year, I wonder if there'd be anybody who'd be embarrassed to, to admit it. Um, I, I'm not against the novels, but if you live in a world of novels, what you're living in a world of is fiction. Correct? Well, this is a historically based novel. Okay, that's good. That's probably a pretty good novel. All I'm saying is, you know, and I have no clue. So, you know, I might just be need to move on because nobody reads any novel. There's nothing wrong with reading a novel. But don't base your life or live, just soak your brain in fairy tale land. What do you fill your mind with? Talking heads? You know what? I don't watch very much news. I used to think watching news was a great thing. I don't watch very much news because you know what happens? I already have high blood pressure and take blood pressure medicine. I don't need any more blood pressure problems. I don't need them. I watch, if, you know, if it's something I have to watch, need to watch, whatever, it's a need to basis. And so really, I've kind of chosen to, whatever I watch, I watch online because I can pick and choose. And then if I don't like, like I just click off, you know, boom, that's it. And, uh, and so I, I don't have to fill my mind with, with stuff it, that, that, is, that is really, in most cases, put out there in order to drive the ratings up instead of really have serious news. So today, news isn't news. News is about ratings, okay? Um, you, you don't have to agree with that, but I feel pretty certain that's the case. Um, what about meaningless trivia? If you're sports guys and everything else, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not picking on anybody, okay? But how many stats do you know from how many teams and how many players? And, I mean, you know, if, if, we're playing, you know, if you play the trivia game, nothing wrong with trivia games, nothing wrong with knowing some trivia. But I'm just talking about if you're like the walk-in trivia champion, I just want to ask that question, other than beating people at trivia, what is it doing for you? Is that developing what God has given you as your intellect? Okay, just asking. I, I, don't, I feel like I'm kind of an unhappy territory right now. Like I'm kind of like kind of walking through. I feel like I'm over in Afghanistan and walking through landmines, you know. Um, what about learning just for selfish ambition? Some people are heady just to be heady. Some people are intelligent just to be intelligent. You know, they use their intelligence just to impress other people. Well, I just want to tell you, God is the one who gave us our intellect. And I want to tell you, I think we've only touched the edge of what our intellect is capable of, and we've already seen that it's capable of significant things in the way our world works. Let's just run over to the brand new management side. Do you seek truth with your intellect? Do you seek truth? Do you have a working knowledge of God and the Bible? You know, or you like the guy we saw last week who was going, well, I'm pretty sure it was Moses that built the ark, and you know, sure, you can't even get. I mean, you may know the trivia of all the baseball teams, but you have no. You it, Bible trivia, phew, you know, you're down. It's out. I'm not even in so much to Bible trivia. 
you know, so if you stump me on where something happened or some geographic graphical thing, I, I, it doesn't matter. I know how to find that. I know how to. But I, when it comes down to the truth about God, what the Bible says about God, and what the Bible, what the Bible says about moral issues and things like that, I don't want to be stumped. It comes down to basic belief patterns and systems. I want to know that. Are you developing your mind? You know, some people. Uh, this is this is. I remember when I was a young pastor. That I was in a setting where there were a lot of pastors and there was a leader guy talking to him and everything. And he said that most pastors stop studying after nine years of pastoring. I'm like, what? You know, I mean, I was just like my second or third year. So I'm like, what? And what they said was they just moved from one church to another every so many years and just re preached the same. I mean, that's probably not, that's probably an exaggeration, but. There's probably some truth to that in some cases. And so what I have to do is just re-preach my old sermons to you guys and hope you don't catch it. No, I'm just kidding. You know, because I've been here so long. Like, hey, I don't see who is here. No, this, you know, I don't mean it wrong, but sometimes I just wide up sermons and throw them away. Because you know why? It served us, it was a meal. I mean, how long do you keep leftovers in your fridge? I know, longer than you should. But I mean, but after a while, you do get rid of them, right? I mean, I don't even care if I come back to the same passage, and I have a file sometimes on that. Sometimes I don't even go look at the file because I want God to speak at me, speak to it, to me through it in a new way. A new, and, 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 and so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with re-preaching something. It's good to say it once. You can say it ten times, and, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just simply saying, are we developing our mind, or do we somewhere along the way just sort of park it and go, I think I know enough to get by. I think I know enough to get by. I'll just stop learning about right here. And we don't do it outright like that, but that happens. Do you know that the top universities in the United States were started by Christians? See, God, God, God's not a dumbbell, by the way. In fact, when more people, when people really get to know God and really get to following God, there's there's something unique even about God, and that is you almost have to, in order to really get to know God, you have to be able to read. God elevates the person in the mind. And so if you, if you need to work on mental development, and I mean that in a, you know, just simply saying intellectual development, then do so because it will honor God. It'll be a good steward of the brain that God has given you. It'd be a terrible thing to stand before God and realize we've used just this little nth of a degree of the thinking capacity that God gave us. Emotional life, your emotional life. The old management, you let your fears control your emotions. You know, it's okay to have them. You know, we live in such a legalized world. Everything's legal. that It, 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 it kind of gets on my nerves after a while. Well, what could happen if, the, what if, what if, what if, what if? It's like, Sometimes I just want to go, why don't we all put on armor suits or something, just walk around, do kind of do, quit worrying about what's going to happen. And I mean, I don't mean that in a careless way, but I just get a little reactionary to it. We're so concerned. Have, we, we operate from fears, from anxiety, from insecurities. Um, and I just don't think that honors God. Certainly wisdom matters. But operating from the standpoint of fear or anxiety is not a good way, to, not a good position to live in life. Seeking to satisfy other people, being a people pleaser, uh, putting ourselves down by comparison or building ourselves up by comparison. We feel good about ourselves when we look at this way. We feel bad about ourselves when we look the other way. On the brand new management side, what if we embraced more peace? I'm talking about internal, you know. Inside, we embraced more peace. We simply said, you know what? God is over and above everything. He placed me here for a purpose. I'm striving to understand that purpose. I'm endeavoring to manage everything that he's given me. I have no idea what to do with this situation here. This, But you know what? All I'm supposed to do is show up and be available and let God help me work through it. 
So I'm going to be at peace. It's ugly, doesn't look very good, looks hard, looks tough, but I'm going to be at peace. What if we just trusted God more? What if we just believed that he really was in charge of the universe? What if we just really believed he actually cared about our lives, cared about our futures, cared about us today, that he actually cares about us? What if we actually embrace the joy that that kind of peace and trust brings? What if we actually developed confidence? And I'm not talking about arrogance, I'm talking about confidence. Confident that in who God is, confident that God is in control of my life, confident that he will be with me, confident that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength, that I would have a feeling of security. You say, yeah, but I don't have this in place, I don't have that in place, and the other thing in place. That's part of why you enjoy life. You're still getting stuff in place. If you have everything in place, you know what we call that? Ready to die. You know, I've got all my ducks in a row. So what's next? Your funeral. We, you know, you know part, life is getting your ducks in a row. And, I, and, and if you have your ducks in a row for too long in advance, you stop living. Now, that, I, listen, understand, anything I'm saying, I'm I say, saying some things a little bit extreme to make a point. Take it in balance, okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having your ducks in a row. What are ducks in a row anyway? Anyway, that's, uh, I know, I'll get to see me emails. Ducks in a row started whenever, anyway. And that's okay, I'd like to know. Your life, your physical life. I wanted to leave this one off, but I didn't feel clear in my spirit to do so, so um, it's here. See, old management is this. Lack of sleep. Because you, know you know why we don't sleep? Because we're in charge of the universe, and if we sleep, something might not happen. I gotta, I'm gonna, I only get four hours sleep a night because I gotta be awake to control the world. Really? Wouldn't it be awesome if you just were restful? You so I'm not a lazy person. I didn't say lazy. I'm just saying get your proper rest. Bad eating habits. Moving on. No, I mean, I mean uh, whew. okay. Kendall gave me a great book for Christmas. It's called The Daniel Plan. I am confident it's a good book. I read the intro to it, and it looks like a really good book. Now, I'm going to read it, Kendall. I am going to read it. And uh, she said, you're not insulted. I said, Kendall, I've only known you like half my life. I'm fine. I'm, you know, you think I don't know this? Anyway, but I'm glad. I know I'm grateful. I don't have to buy the book now. And I feel guilty that I spent money and didn't read it. No, I'm just kidding. That's a... Um, Lack of exercise. Okay. You know, there's sometimes whenever you're preaching, and it's real obvious you're preaching to yourself, and you just hope other people are listening in. So these are some things, obviously, where I've got to work on some old management styles and move it into the brand new management. Here is the brand new management, and it says this. I am God's house. How does this house look? And I don't mean movie star stuff or anything like that. I'm just talking about does it look healthy? You know, I'm, because I'm a pastor, or maybe not because I'm a pastor, I don't know. But, but as a pastor, one of the things that I'm kind of ticky about is how the facilities look, how the yard looks. I can remember visiting a church one time and I walked in on a Sunday morning and you could almost see the building from the grass growing up about this high. And I just remember thinking, man, that does not represent God very well. And uh, it was a nice service, but I still couldn't get the grass out of my brain. I know that was my problem or whatever, but I still didn't think it represented. I've seen churches that are run down, that are beat up, that seem like they're just they're from another, another century almost, just kind of left, left to themselves. But yet, sometimes people still meet in them. That's wonderful that it's still used. But it doesn't represent God very well. I don't care if you have a little shoebox of a church. You can still make it look decent. And so I'm saying all that to say this. I've had to ask myself this question in more recent times. God's living in you, Rod. And when that, when that leaks out in a given situation... 
Man, how's God looking? So that's my, I guess, confession. Uh, and, 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 you know, however you allow God to speak to you on that. Um, spiritual, your spiritual life. The old management is this. I'm spiritual. Look what, look what God has done in me. You want to hear my testimony? Yeah, I used to be a bad sinner. Sounds like you're still doing it. No, just anyway. Uh, see that arrogant. There's in 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 this in the old management. There's all kinds of room for arrogance and self-sufficient and self-righteous. But if we can just remember, we were bought with a price. You're not your own wife because you were bought with a price at a price. The price of Jesus dying. It's his righteousness and his alone. It's through his love for us that we could ever choose to love him. There is no room for arrogant, self-righteous, self-sufficient spiritual life. But it does seem like Sometimes it doesn't take people very long down the road of being a Christ follower to all of a good, you know, their life does improve, it does get better, and all of a sudden it's us versus them. And I think that's very dishonoring to God. Brand new management, your spiritual life should be filled with faith. Faith. Belief. Belief in an awesome God. And the reason you believe he's such an awesome God because you know, do know what he's done for you. And you do have a testimony of his goodness and his grace. And you are, you are forgiven. And you are humble. And you are compassionate. And you're about the good news, not about yourself. You're about the good news, not about yourself. It's real easy sometimes, just even in our church, you know, and you get, we get so churchified, we'll say things like, well, this is my church. Say, is this your church, Rod? Well, I, I know what they mean. So I could, you know, you can say yes, but I don't, I never am really comfortable with that answer. Say, it's, no, it's God's church and he allows me to hang out here. It's God's church and he allows me to be the pastor here. I have a responsibility. I have I have things that I'm in charge of, yes. But it's God's church, and I'm just responsible. And so it, it, that's how we have to be in our lives. Is this your family? Yes, it is. It's the one God's given me. I'm trying to do my best with it. Woo, it's a tough job, too. You know, he, he must have really believed in me because he gave me a couple of kids that are like, woo, you know. And, uh, you know, so you, I, I'm just saying you say all that, but you, we, when you lose that perspective, it's all about you instead of all about what God has given you and made you responsible and accountable to him for. Your stuff. Let's go to your stuff. Finances. Old management would be this. You know, greed, debt, entitlement, Loving of things instead of loving of people. That's the old style. It's mine, 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 mine. It is yours to take care of for God. It is. But you got to remember that. Now let's go over to finances on the brand new management side. I am responsible for everything God has given me. All the funds, all the things, I will answer to him one day for that. And you know, that's true whether you're a gazillionaire or whether you only have pennies to your name, that you still are accountable to God for what he gives to you. Sometimes, sometimes you know, you might be, you meet someone who's poor and they just think, well, because I'm poor, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't, you know, I've got a license to kind of do whatever I want to do. No, you don't. It doesn't matter if you're dirt poor or if you're dirty wealthy. We're going to give an account for how we've done with what we have. The amount is not the issue. 
And I also will say this, and that is the traits of someone who operates under stewardship or brand new management will be, tr if someone is under that new management, it'll be true whether you're poor or wealthy. It doesn't, you know, some people go, well, if I win the lottery, I, you know, people, I've, I, you don't know how many motorcycles I'll get if people win the lottery. I, if I win the lottery, you know, you, I mean, you don't know how many, you know, here is the deal. First of all, you have a better chance of dying right now than winning the lottery. That's the first thing, number one thing. So just, you know, so I'll probably go to your funeral first. And then, we'll, and, then, and, and then the second thing is this. You don't know what you'll do. And I tell you, but except for this, I, I'll give you one prediction. And this is one of the reasons why so many people that do win the lottery end up losing it before too many years. It's because getting the lottery didn't change who they were as a person. They still function just like they always had. And the way they'd been functioning wasn't working too well. So it didn't work too well with a little, didn't work too well with a lot. And so, with, so, so you start not based on what you have or don't have. You start this based on who God wants you to be. And here's some things he wants in the brand new management as a steward. He wants you to be faithful. You say, well, what is faithfulness? Well, as it relates to God's obligations to God or things that he would say, these are the expectations that I have. The Bible's pretty clear across the board that 10% is kind of like give back to God. That's a way of showing our faithfulness to him as he's given faithful to us. And you say, well, you know, how do you, you know, how do you know that? How do you know that? Well, I even think in terms of when Jesus, they were, he was being questioned, you know, what do you give to Caesar and what do you give to the, you know, to, to God and all that? And he got that coin and he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Basically, what he's saying is pay your taxes and pay your tithe. I, I can't, that's what, that, that's just a simple answer. And you say, he didn't say tithe. He said, give to God what is God. Anybody in that time period, what would they have thought? If he said, give to God what is God's, they would have thought a tithe. That's exactly what they would have thought. And if you don't agree with it, you can come Wednesday night and we can talk about it, okay? But, uh, but so, so, so he expects a tithe. He's honored by offerings. And certainly honored then by generosity that goes to simply, as you live your life, you're a generous person with other people. I believe brand new management would say, let's do debt reduction. If you haven't already done it, and there'd be another class coming up, peace, financial peace, let's get in the debt reduction thing. Let's start honoring God with how we function, not only in our giving, but in our living. Because, and that's one of the things you'll notice about us. We believe people need to give, and we'll teach it. But we also believe we need to live in God-honoring ways. And so the essence is this, if you work in under, operate under brand new management, that you're faithful to give what God asks you to give. His standard is 10%. If that seems overwhelming to start wherever God tells you to start and work toward that. Then he wants you to give offerings. He wants you to be a generous person, and he wants you to get rid of your debt. Many other things, but those are the things I mentioned today. So on your stuff, let's talk about professional. In your professional world, under old management, it's all about power and pride. I'm going to climb as high as I can climb, as fast as I can climb on top of whoever I can climb on top of. Brand new management, I work to honor God. I work to provide for my family and my own personal needs. And I work to be a person who's a contributor to our society to make this world a better place. Now let's go to your people. Now you know good and well that when we talk about relationships, that it's almost impossible for us to think of doing this in one minute. But we're going to do it, okay? Here's under old management, relationally, you use people, control, and manipulate people. That's the old management style. New management is this, brand new management, is you give and take, you exercise unconditional love with appropriate boundaries, and self-management. I'm going to close with this. As we went down through these seven areas, the four in your life, two in your stuff, one in your people. If there's one or two that God spoke to you about, I'd like for you at the bottom of your sheet to draw a cross. 
Just to draw a cross over at the right-hand side as you're facing your sheet. Draw a cross. Under that cross or at the foot of the cross, I'd like for you to write down, maybe it's in the area of emotions, your emotional life, that you need to move into brand new management. I have physical written down here on my sheet. I have another one too, but I have physical written down. And maybe it's professional. Maybe it's relational. But it's an area where you need to move from old management to new management. I want you to write that down there. And I want you, as you write it down there, you're making a commitment in your heart to surrender this area to God, to ask him to give you some brand new management, brand new way of doing things, to op not operate as an owner, but to operate as a steward. And I'm going to say a prayer with you. And what I would like for you to do is if there's anybody, you don't have to, and just because uh, you don't do this doesn't mean you didn't write something down. It just sometimes it's good for us to go on record. If there's anybody who wrote something down that would like to stand with me because I'm standing, they would like to stand with me just as a kind of a nail down. I, I marked it down there. I marked something down there as I say a closing prayer. If anyone would care to stand just where you are, uh, you're welcome to do that as we pray.